Okay. <laughs> what was the idea behind it to start with? It, do you know, it, um, it grew out of uh, a documentary called Truly Madly Deeply, which was about the Stars in the Skies dating agency. And the commissioning editor for that um, wanted to build something on from that. And, that, and he and Betty developed the series. Um, I mean, um, I should definitely let Addy to speak about this yeah, because yeah. It's, it's a Channel 4 show. Yeah. But um, it's been, a, I think, a quite phenomenal success. I mean, I watched the first episode go out and watched the Twitter feed and um, was, I just loved the way it went from um, people sort of stuck a bit laughy at these people and then it was, they started rooting for them and saying, you know, don't take that chip, don't pick up the chip, Richard. And they were kind of right behind them and they absolutely recognised the experience of the hideosity of a first date mm -hmm. with somebody and getting it all wrong. So it felt like it started off as something that was about disability, but it had, it had broken that, made it universal. And um, it's, a, it's an absolute labour of love um, in terms of getting the casting right. It's an incredibly difficult show to cast because it's, um, you know, it's hard to find anyone who will allow cameras into that situation. And um, I, I think um, they did a, they've done an amazing job with it, really. I, I can't... I know some people hate it, um, but I think more people love it, really. Addy, yeah, no, we've carried channel, on with this. Yeah, and Channel 4 point of view, we're incredibly proud of it. Mm -hmm. I think it's a show that's lovingly made. I think also, what for me, what I love about it is that the universality of it, you start from a point of difference, but it actually ends up being a point of similarity because every one of us wants to find love. And I think that that's the big strength of it, so we can all relate to it. And I think that sort of moving on from that as well, we've got a show called First Dates, which is this in the sort of territory. And I watched an episode last week, and there was a guy that had a disability, and he went on a date, and the person he had a date with never mentioned it. And it was just quite interesting, it was just the first date. And so I think that those things all help to push the experience of disability to the mainstream and it becomes just one of the main things that you are, you know, so I think that those shows do a great service and also because they're so popular as well, so they're right at the heart of our schedule and they're our most popular shows, so lots of people are learning about disability from these sorts of shows and it helps to normalise it, so I, I mean I love the well, uh, let me put an alternative here yeah. from a friend of mine yeah. who's got brittle bones and is quite yeah. small. There was a, a person yeah. very similar. It wasn't her. Mm -hmm. And uh, she recently wrote a blog about visiting uh, the last freak show on Coney Island where people pay money to look at people because they're different. And she said that your, that show makes her feel like that. And she's walking around the streets of Newham and people shout out, why? van man shouts out of the, the van at her, oh, did you get that date then? And she feels very demeaned by the whole thing. So that's a, an alternate position. And I think the problem with this low-touch education, I, I agree it's entertaining and it gets good schedules, but does it actually change people's thinking about disability? That, that's the issue I would put out there, and I'd be interested in what other people think on the panel about that. Well, I'm not, I'm not really convinced that documentaries... Now, I'm a drama person, mm. and I'm not convinced that documentaries really change uh, and, you know, attitudes and such. Really? Uh, no, My I'm name is convinced. John. Sorry? Didn't that change people's attitudes about Tourette's? Sorry? Maybe you see Doc. No, sorry. But I mean, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't think really that they change attitudes oh. to the same degree as a drama, partly because I've been involved in documentaries. 35 years. And, I, and, and as I said, you know, there was this thing that I did uh, in 2005. It, I did it as a joke. I saw this advert, The Odd Couple. I don't know if you saw it, but it was a series of documentaries in which they were obviously focusing on odd couples. And I happened to, you know, I have a girlfriend who is you know, non disabled, three times my height, etc., etc. And I said, do you fancy being on this, etc. So we did it. I never watched it, because I can't stand watching me anyway. But um, I don't think it 
really changed anybody's attitude. But if you made a drama of it, and people could actually identify with those two characters, and you made a story, then that is more effective. The key thing is, though, in the end, everyone has to watch. You know, if, the, if, if you make a brilliant drama and only 300,000 people watch it, nobody changes their mind. If you, watch, if you make a documentary that five million people watch, you will be, if you were in that documentary, you'll be walking down the street and people will say, I saw you last night, I saw you last night, and they will change their minds. If there's if that's the point of the, of the show. Sometimes it's not. Well, at you have small audience, if you have small audiences, for TV, drama, or the film, is because it's not marketed for them. Yeah. It's not distributed. Mm -hmm. And in, you know, what does BBC or Channel 4 do but stick it out at about 11 o'clock at night to ensure that people don't see it? Well, so, I mean, that's, I mean, Let's talk about mainstream dramas that have included disabled actors. You know, well, two episodes the of section. Doctor Who that got, you know, four or five million that had a deaf actor in. Just recently. Yeah. yeah. So, so you can't, I mean, there isn't a rule that says if you've got a disabled person in a drama, it's always going to go out late at night. We haven't heard from two members of our panel on this on, on datables. What, what's your view as a writer and as an actor? You know, I don't watch it, so I can't really, uh, I can't really comment. I'm sorry, Alison. Uh, but, um, uh, but, you know, yeah, yeah. I do find it quite heartwarming, because I think it is, like you said, Friday, very lovingly made. I, d I personally find it quite heartwarming. I personally wouldn't feel comfortable being, like, purely because I the thought of anyone watching me, like, on any of my first dates would be... <laughs> oh my life, hell on earth. But um, for me, I thought it was very lovingly made, and I, I personally feel that by having different disabilities out there and showing that they're actually out there looking for love, it's not something alien, it's something mm. that's out there, something that's happening. And um, as well, just, just general improving people's understanding of what Asperger's is. Or what I, can see, I can see some people is. wanting to speak from the audience, oh, yeah. I'm going to resist that, but I'm going to do a straw <laughs> poll of the audience. How many people think Undateables has improved uh, people, the public's view of disabled people, if you can put your hand up if you think it has, and how many people think it hasn't? Well, we're about Ooh. even, yeah, even yeah, yeah, yeah. there, I'm afraid. Uh, but obviously I think people will have views about this, and when we finish going through the panel and the clips, we'll come back to it, if that's all right, okay? So now we're going to, people have been saying, Nabil made us strongly there, that drama is a better way of changing attitudes. It all depends if many people see it, of course, which is at the point Alison was making. But uh, we've got some dramas here to have a look at. And we're going to start with a rather shocking clip from a Dennis Potter film, uh, play. But all Dennis Potter's plays had some aspect of disability. He was disabled himself with a uh, psoriasis and a major skin problem all through his life. Uh, but always, was also one of the new wave of writers, working class writers, writing for the new audience of mass television. And he did bring a lot of issues. But here he's going really over the top with... Brimstone and Treacle in the first one, uh, with the, someone playing the devil, raping someone who's uh, a girl who's been uh, brain injured by her father driving her over. So we'll start with that and then look at some more uh, palatable clips. Um, what do you, let's start with the, the deck for graffiti. That seemed very, uh, a very genuine scene there. How did you get that authenticity? It's partly my experience. Mm -hmm. But the thing was, is that, you know, um, deck for graffiti came about because I, I asked a, a writer if she would write a love story for me to star it. She'd already, um, written a part for me in some children's drama that went out at Christmas. And whilst we were filming that, I said, you fancy writing a love story for me? Because quite frankly, I've been trying to write a love story 
for television and so on, and have not got anywhere. So maybe I'm going to have to ask Anne-Marie the same person. And since she already had a bit of cred, and <coughs> so she said, yeah, okay. So she spent some time with me talking about, you know, different storylines, etc., etc. And I gave her bits of my autobiography. And the funny thing about it was that she put it on hold because the bill had uh, commissioned her to write an episode where they wanted me to be in it. And um, so she started to create this character, George, for the bill. But the uh, producers decided but this character was too big for the bill. And uh, so they just said, look, uh, we can't do that, but maybe you could rewrite it. So Channel 4 stepped in and said, this is in 19, they said, uh, okay, uh, we'll give you some money to write a, a drama, expanding on this particular story. And that's how it happened. Jack, we saw two two things I think you were involved in there. Yeah. Um, how, when you were thinking about portraying disabled characters, and it was a plus for cast us to actually cast six disabled actors in those parts. Yeah. But how do you how do you get to characterise those parts? And I think for people who hasn't seen it, it's not just the interactions on the island, but each character has their backstory yeah. uh, illustrated as well. Um, the, uh well, we did cast off slightly differently in that um, it was Alison's commission and Alison who fought for it and gave us that opportunity. Um, uh, we didn't have much money. Um, uh, I, yeah. we, we had, uh, I think normal shows cost about uh, uh, 500 grand an hour. We had 100 grand an hour. Um, uh, and so um, it was uh, trying to work out how, how we could tell the story as simply as possible as well as um, uh, trying to get the complexity right at the same time. Um, we decided pretty early on that we wanted to cast it as we were writing it and then let the casting decisions impact on the, um, on the, on the, on the, on the drama. We wanted the six best actors we could find uh, to play these parts and, um, and, uh, and, and, and we went out and we um, uh, tried to meet and work with as many um, uh, disabled actors as we could and then and then they helped shape their roles um, uh, and uh, and I think with with writing uh, generally the thing that um, that interests me at the moment and the thing that I hope we're going to get into a situation of is rather than saying I've written this part it's for a person with CP who's got do you know what I mean like you know one leg and, do you know what I mean like you know that, that, that you kind of that there is a sort of because we're starting to get into the role where, when when we when we uh, color blind casting it's called do you know what I mean like you know where you don't necessarily what well, yeah but but uh, and um, and um, uh, where all parts are up for grabs uh, rather than just kind of like the token parts um, and um, and uh, I did this other show called the fades um, which ended up we, we we did exactly that and ended up with Genevieve Barr in, in one of the roles and and uh, and I hope that that's going to be um, uh, you know, I think that's the way that the, the boundaries will eventually get broken down. It's not shows like cast offs, um, uh, uh, but actually, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of more mainstream shows that are shown at the more mainstream times, um, where, uh, you know, the likes of Neville, um, uh, you know, can play, you know, like, you know, whoever um, on the show, you know. Now, um, Eddie, that was uh, three of those, I think, were Channel uh, 4 successes really, over the years. Uh, how's the channel looking at sort of drama now with regard to making sure that the casting is across all areas? Yeah, I mean, I think the sort of challenge for us, and you know, I'm interested to hear what Nabil said about drama because I think that you know, our long running soap is Hollyoaks, mm -hmm. and we have had the disabled characters in there in the past, but we haven't currently got one, so that's one of the areas we're really trying to work on because clearly the impact of having someone in a show like that on every night is quite, you know, quite big impact and sort of playing storylines where 
your disability isn't the heart of the storyline, you're just there acting. So I think that's a yeah. big thing that we really need to crack mm -hmm. and we're working really hard on it because I think that if you're trying to find a character for Hollyoaks, they just need to be hot, like everyone else is in Hollyoaks. That's sort of the criteria. So I think we're looking at that. Um, I also think that generally, I mean, I was talking, uh, you know, I was. I, it's a similar thing, but it's not the same. But I was talking to Stephen Moffat, who makes Doctor Who, and he was saying that unless he writes particularly that a character is going to be black or disabled, the default is that they become white and able bodied. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of quite an interesting thing about how you become available for all roles. And I think that that's an area where we have to get better but as a history. But if he's got an issue with that, why yeah. is he not challenging it? Well, he does it. So if you don't even look to the first series, if this series Doctor Who, the opening scene has got two black actors in, they had to say they were going to be black actors, else they would have been, he said, defaultly cast as white. Is the exec producer? Yeah, that's what I'm saying, so he, he wrote it in. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so he actually okay. has to write it in, because I mean, if he doesn't write it in himself, he says that often... So he, he is sort of operating a, a quota system in well, his not own quota system, sort of way. In his own sort of way, but I think that, you know, and it, it, I don't know if that's the right answer with disability, but it does seem that if you don't, the, the default tends to be towards casting able-bodied people. Yeah, I suppose my thing is, yeah. Stephen's the exact producer of yes. that show, he's an incredibly yeah. powerful person on that yes. show, he doesn't have to write them as black, he no. has to just have a conversation just with his casting person yes. and say, do you yeah. know what I mean, like, you know, we need to open this up, do you know what I mean, yeah. like, rather than, do you know what I mean, like, you yes. know, I, don't, I don't necessarily think that's, do you know what I mean, like, you know. Bring yeah. Ruth in here, we, we saw you doing a very powerful portrayal there. What what was your feeling about that production and what, what is the spin off for me? Uh, for me I was it was a very long casting process but it was very, <laughs> Sorry. very, very no 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 it was <laughs> very very worth it. It was an absolute honour to be involved in, let alone to have to look one of the lead roles. It was it was absolutely fantastic. I think one of the things that I cherished so much on that was the fact that it was it wasn't clear cut yes they definitely should keep the baby no they definitely shouldn't it was but it was left and from Red's perspective directors all that kind of thing it was it was left at the end people will make their own decision on whether or not they thought that was the right decision or the wrong decision and I think to start that debate start that conversation I think that's what it did so well we're running out of time to allow the audience to speak, so I'm going to run the, the soap, uh, soap one now, and then uh, there's a little input from me on that to broaden it out, and then we'll go straight on to the comedy and then come back to the panel, if that's all right. So we'll pick up soaps and comedy uh, with my little bit in the middle, and then, then we'll open it up to the audience. Okay, so if we could run the next one, please. Thank you. Hopes and uh, comedy, and then I'll open it up to, to the audience in about three minutes. So anybody, things struck you from that? Obviously, the soaps are making an effort now. The, there is more going on, but it isn't, as Alison said, it's not there all the time in, in the diversity that it should be there. Um, how can we improve that? Maybe Addy, we'll start with that. How can we improve it? Mm. Um, I think we just, I think we have to keep pushing and you know, people like myself and Alice Little, the, the, the BBC, we just have to keep pushing for more representation across all major shows and as we've said, you know, the impact of things that are on every night is so important that I think those are the sort of places that we have to really, really target. So I just think we just have to keep pushing and I think we have to keep talking to casting agents and you know, we just need to keep working. I mean, we're sort of trying to work out how we do it looking forward and we're sort of trying to work out the places and the draw on the slate, beyond the soap, where the opportunities are and starting from that point of view. But yeah, you know, we've got to just keep pushing. Amen. Yeah. And Alison, what, you, you've got a target, I think, to quadruple portrayal across the BBC's yeah. channels in two years. How, how are you setting about that? Yeah, the, the commissioning areas don't realise that I'm going to make them each quadruple that. <laughs> <laughs> this is not just across, you know. 
I mean, it, that, that thing, um, that criticism that's levelled against the soaps that's always only one character mm -hmm. is so depressing. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, every time I have a meeting with commissioning, I'm in the genre meetings with the different areas, programme areas across the, um, I just, just have to keep banging on, really, <coughs> until, because as Jack said earlier, you know, it is just a question of just doing it. You know, the people in power can just make it happen. They don't need to sort of do focus groups. They just need to say, we want to see some disabled character, disabled actors for, for parts in this drama, not for this part that we've written that is disabled, this one part, which means that only people with that disability are eligible for it. They, we have to just open it up. Do you think, uh, now we've got in this debate the BBC's launched about what is the BBC and what's the future of the BBC, do you think we could raise some of these issues during that debate that's going on currently? Yes, please. Right, so you've all got <laughs> something to do there, right into the BBC. Um, Nabil, uh, you were telling me before that you've written quite a lot of plays and drama and novels and so on, <coughs> but what's the difficulty with getting the, the experience, first-hand experience of disabled people actually produced? What, what are the difficulties? Well, I mean, there are the difficulties haven't changed mm -hmm. in that producers still prefer uh, non-disabled people in such roles. If we're talking about mainstream, a difficulty is commercialism. The difficulty is, is attracting big audiences. So, you know, I wrote a film script about the disabled Holocaust in Nazi Germany. The producer so it's a great script, but you need to have, you know, Hollywood stars playing those disabled characters. Now that was written back in 97, originally in the first draft. In uh, 1984, I got commissioned by the BBC to write a love story for me to star in, called um, Telephone Dummies. And it got dropped. And I asked a friend of mine who was a writer, an actor in the BBC, and I said, was it the politics? Because, you know, I'm a lefty, and there's a lot of left-wing politics in there. He said, no, it's not the politics. It's because you've got a scene of a disabled person in bed with a non-disabled woman. And he said, you know, it's too soon for them. That was 1984. <coughs> and the big problem is that if we could have started then. You know, if the BBC had had, you know, weren't such cowards at that time and went ahead and made it, we could have got a lot further by now. And then, of course, we've got um, in depth of graffiti and all that. And there are just so many attempts, you know. I've written a, a story which was a, a film script <coughs> that was um, about a disabled bloke who's addicted to prostitutes and he spends all his money every week trawling the streets of London. <coughs> but he gets involved in a murder mystery. And you've got Jack the Ripper, uh, wannabe, etc. That's a story which would have appeal to a mass audience because it's a thriller, it's a crime thriller, etc. etc. It just so happens that the person that's investigating it is a, a person in a wheelchair. And that is one of those things is going to help change attitudes. And, you know, we've seen this constant <laughs> back and forth going on, and we're not moving, really. And uh, just a quick word from, from Jack and Ruth. Do you think over this span, we started in 72, things have improved, and where do you see us going? I think, I th really what Ed said earlier was, mm. in some ways it has, in some ways we seem to be stuck. Mm. And I think, just the more pushing that's done, I think it'll happen eventually, just as long as we just keep going. I think, yeah, what Nabil was saying, which is interesting, is, you know, there needs to be an actor, a disabled actor, that becomes uh, a Denzel Washington. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, like, no, and I don't know... I don't know whether the, the, the system will support that, I don't know where that actor will come from, but that's the next stage where there's a genuine breakthrough sort of star where you go. It's not sort of like, um, uh, you know, a, 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 a niche story, it becomes a sort of detective story. Um, you know, yeah, and maybe it's, maybe it's the real, maybe it's Bruce. 
Do you know what I mean? Like you know, like you know, the, the, you know, well, like you know. Well, I'm waiting. Exactly, exactly, in, in the house. exactly. But that's so why. Thanks. Oh. I'm gonna, you all get a chance, one minute to conclude your thinking. But I'm going to open it up now. We've got people with mics. Can I see where they are? Okay. Yeah. So I stopped you in the middle there, guy with the longish hair in the middle of that row, fourth row. Yeah, that's you. Yeah, the guy shaking his head around. You, you can have the mic first, as I stopped you earlier on. And can I see other people who might want to say something in this, please? All right, one, two, three, uh, was there someone over here? Four, I've got those four there. Anyway, there's the next ones. Yeah, uh, no, the guy behind you first, uh, and then you next. Got, got yeah. Mine for yeah. Um, so okay, if you tell us who you are, it might be helpful. Um, my name's Byron Kinesi, and um, I don't mind being the next to Washington. Awesome, <laughs> yeah, awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is gonna be quite um, an emotional uh, thing I'm going to say now because I've got personal experience with it, so uh, it comes from the heart. First of all, the thing about popularity, um, just to address that point, um, I'm really against that um, because the last time I heard um, from various sources, if you go on the internet and you look up any of these horrific terrorist uh, videos doing sickening things, they've got about 5 million hits or 10 million hits to make them okay to make those videos. And under the premise of like, let's go with popularity, then the BBC should be making a few more of those because we could really make some uh, money there. But obviously, that's not right. Um, and uh, further into that point, um, this is where my personal experience comes from. People, when it, I've, I've had three lots of brain surgery myself. I've been quite unwell at times. I've been on various medications and suffered from all sorts of mental health things over the years since I was a child. Anyway, um, the point is that when I was ill for a few years back, I actually was in, felt like I was in a safe haven of a brain injury organisation, I'm not going to mention the name for legal reasons, and I was approached by an organisation that wanted to make a documentary um, about people with head injuries. And I signed the form and I went along with it. Sadly, I don't remember doing that because I wasn't very well at the time. I didn't think I was not very well at the time. I think my mum probably would agree that I wasn't very well at the time. Um, I then, a few years later, got, um, got asked by somebody uh, what that was all about because they found it. Um, I then had an absolute heart attack when I read the stuff that I'd apparently said. So um, I was well at that time, so I recovered. I was very fortunate to recover. Other people were not so fortunate. Um, I then phoned up the organisation and asked them to remove anything to do with me from that documentary. They obviously put up a fight. And um, I said I wasn't well at the time. I then threatened legal action and they did. So my second point is I, I don't think it's ethical to make documentaries about people with mental illness. It's becoming a very trendy thing to do to get people with brain injury and whatnot just when they've just come out of hospital <coughs> to appear on this documentary. So I think you have to really be careful, guys. You're making like dating videos with people that aren't very well. They're not well enough to consent right. always. Thank you. Two points well made. I know you've probably got others there, but I'm going to Sorry. stop you yeah. there, all right? Thanks. Can we have the person in front of you? Yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, Navin Kikabai. Uh, a couple of things just to pick up on, on the key point you was making, and I'm particularly uh, interested in your views around uh, you know, pushing the boundaries, so to speak. And, and so now I, I work in higher education and I'm uh, you know, particularly puzzled, well, uh, you know, around the place of disabled people within performing arts. And uh, you know, I, I recently uh, finished an evaluation of a theatre company called Razor Edge, who attempted to work with individuals who described as having learning difficulties and the surmountable, <coughs> insurmountable barriers that they experienced to get people with the level of learning difficulties through performing arts degree programs. And, and, and if we're talking about pushing those boundaries and where the next generation or the generation of performing arts, I just wondered what your views were in terms of uh, how we push those boundaries and from your own experiences. And I know Nabil say, for example, in disability and theatre, back, back to the days of Grey Eye, uh, attempting to uh, support individuals through theatre. And I wonder, where, where are we with, with that particular agenda? We will hold on to that one till the end and come back on it. Yeah, we need to talk about access to work in relation yeah, to that. Yeah. We, so keep your points. We, we'll take these uh, four people who indicated now and then the panel can come in. Uh, there was a woman in black here, yeah, and there's someone in the next row I down in blue. That, uh, my name's Judy Graham. I've worked in television, BBC, ITV, Channel 4, documentaries 
um, I worked on Man Alive in the 1970s. I think one of the things that hasn't come out this evening is the role of the producers, the documentary filmmakers, in the process. Now, I think that the Undateables, for example, but there are many other examples, what hasn't come across is the manipulation in the nicest possible way um, that has to be involved in the production process in making it all happen. We all know as producers that it doesn't just happen by itself. You manipulate to an enormous extent so that the, the people who are quotes undateable magically get a date through an agency. Now, in real life, I don't think it's like that. And there is an, an enormous discrepancy between what is shown on television and the reality of disabled people's experiences. I've had MS in 45 years, and I know that when you try and date when you're disabled, it's an absolute <coughs> amazing nightmare. And I think really there is a huge discrepancy between the reality, which I'm afraid is still very bad, and what is shown on television, which tries to put a sort of spin on it being better than it actually is. Thank you for that point. And there's a woman in the next row down in blue. Uh, we pass it to her. And those were the first four I saw, so we'll come back on those. Others have got points to make. Think about them. We'll have one more round. Yeah. Hello. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I can't. That's why I'm asking. Um, two brief points. Who are you? Sorry, it's Julie McNamara. Right. Thank you. Um, the first is... We used to run the Disability Film Festival here at the NFT, myself and Charlotte Kim Yonchu. And it went from a two-day event to a week-long event, gathering three and a half thousand people per week, each year. Um, the amount of submissions we had from deaf and disabled filmmakers was enormous. So Charlotte still has a massive archive of independent film <clears throat> excuse me, made by disabled filmmakers and deaf filmmakers. Some brilliant stuff in that archive. So my question would be to people who are looking for more diversity on television. Why aren't you reaching out for the indies, given there's so little money around commissioning? Why aren't you showing some of that stuff on television as well? And the other thing I want to flag up is, I was part of a diversity committee for disability in the BBC way back in the mid-90s. It was called Spectrum. And I remember then people like um, Chris Evans in education was talking about quotas and the importance of pushing that envelope and making sure we are deaf and disabled people. Um, included on education programmes, included in uh, drama and documentary and um, and then five years ago I remember Kate Rowland talking to an equity meeting talking about quotas then and saying actually I think it's important now that we start pushing for a certain percentage of people in every level of programming every level of production management and I still don't see that so are you saying there shouldn't be a quota are you saying Actually, we're just going to mention it and the odd producer will put it through their scripts. The odd casting director will have that thinking. Because I don't think it's going to happen unless we're proactive. Thanks, Julie. Thank you. I'd like an answer. Yeah, I'll, I'm coming back to the panel now. We've got questions on quotas. We've got Sorry, questions yeah. on getting a more realistic portrayal of disabled people's lives, getting away from the gloss. To, to trying to get down into to the reality. Uh, let's start with those and any other points you want to react to. So, so we'll come along the line, Addy. Okay. So, so, I, can I, so I'll just take one question, but I'll take the last one, which is the one about quotas. Um, we at Channel 4 last year launched our 360 degree diversity charter, which was a sort of big document which is about how we were going to move forward and increase diversity on and off screen in the industry. And the big strand of that is our commissioning diversity guidelines. I wouldn't call them quotas, I'd call them targets, but every programme we now commission has to do something on screen around diversity and off screen around diversity. And the off screen has got a target of 15% of the workforce to be from either a BAME or a disabled background. And we'll be publishing how we've done against those at some point in the future. So we are going down that 
route. And I think sometimes targets can be targets, we've done two targets for protests. But I know what you mean. You do need things that change that have a structural impact on how we do things, otherwise you end up having conversations like this forever, sort of thing. Oh well, we have been we're yeah. here again. Yeah. 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 So I, I, I take your point. Okay, so that's an answer. Thank you. What about how, how does the BBC respond to that? I know you're new in post, only really three weeks working yeah, there. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the on screen disability, I, I don't really see that as a. I don't, I, you know, I think that should be at that bare minimum, quadrupling, because we're starting from a very low base. But, I mean, it's worth mentioning Diamond, I suppose, because yeah. we are, all the broadcasters are going to be properly measured for off-screen and on-screen yeah. by this big new monitoring system mm -hmm. uh, where the stats will start coming through next year. Yes, that's right. Um, so everyone has got that in their mind. <coughs> and I can tell you the conversations I have now, even in the couple of months I've been at the BBC, it's on everybody's agenda because they're, you know, they are being forced to do it. So... You know, it's I, good I, I don't. Hear that, Alison, after I, all this time. I know. I mean, I'm as I'm as bored with the conversations as you are. I am. See you later for a while. And uh, <laughs> it's it's worth bearing in mind that both Channel Four and the BBC are public bodies, and they come under the the Equalities Act, which isn't just complying. There's a duty to promote equality, and I think that's one of the reasons behind Diamond and other such things to actually try and move things forward. On this end of the panel, what about making things real? How do we get more people in and how do we make the portrayal and what's the programmes there more real uh, to the lives of disabled people? Um, speaking from my perspective mm -hmm. as a writer, um, I, I think that there's a lot of fear mm -hmm. around uh, disability which sometimes the disabled community don't help. Um, uh, and um, and uh, the, the trouble is when you, when you, when you make something you're frequently shot down for it not being something else, um, and um, and that's that's very tough. Um, uh, the truth is, it is a massive fight um, every time uh, that you try and make something uh, about the disabled experience, um, uh, and uh, you know you, the, you, you, we've just got to try and enlist as many writers and producers as, as possible in that. Um, I am worried about the change in government regulations and what that means because it's going to make it more expensive mm -hmm. to work with disabled talent. Um, uh, Grey Eye Theatre Company, you're a theatre company I'm involved with, we're just doing a play together. You know, uh, Jenny Seely is saying quite openly she's not sure how she's going to keep the doors open. This is on access to work. Yeah, yeah. access to work is, is causing massive problems. And from Access um, to work pays uh, disabled people additional needs of being employed, but there are now quotas and restrictions on it. You know, imagine the conversations you're having with producers where you're going, I want to, I want to work with disabled talent on this, and, and, they, and they, they're, they're agreeing to it, mm. and then you say, and it's going to cost you more on your budget. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, it, it, becomes, it becomes more difficult, and, and it, I, I think it's a disgrace the government's done it, but it's, it presents a whole massive new problem for the artistic community in terms of breaking down that fear barrier, which mm. is the most important thing to do. When I first got involved with uh, Channel 4 and BBC, I mean, certainly Channel 4 in the 90s, there was a requirement, if a programme was about disability, you needed a disability uh, consultant to at least bounce the ideas off. And certainly, right. uh, I thought that was a good idea. Certainly some of the more eccentric ideas that producers had, uh, we sort of shot down and it became more realistic. I, I wondered if that's a way forward again. But uh, I was coming down the line, so... Um. Well, from my perspective as, as an actress, I think um, I'm very lucky that my, my agent will put me forward for any role that is of um, a certain age, female, you know, white or whatever, black, you know, it doesn't really make a difference. She will put me forward for anything if she feels that I could I could do that, that role. Um, She's not going to put you forward for a black person's role, surely. Yeah, well, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I mean, black person's playing Ironside, so why shouldn't she? Mixed, it doesn't yeah. <laughs> So she, she'll put me forward for anything that she feels that I could play. Um, and then she comes up against barriers when they say no, that person won't fit because we've not got a disability in the story. So the, 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 it, it is like a barrier there and yeah. a barrier there and a barrier yeah. there. Right, okay. Last word on this. But I'm not quite <coughs> sure what we mean by making it more real, mm. really. I mean, all we're asking for is that disabled characters reflect 
the world mm. that other people experience. So, I mean, a lot of drama is about unreality. It's about absurd situations. It's about extreme situations. And another aspect of drama is, you know, extreme characters and, and so on. And, you know, TV and film is not really about the real world as such. But what has to happen is that when a disabled person watches a film or drama, TV drama, they need to say, that's me, in a way. They need to uh, actually identify with the characters that are being presented and feel that that's who they are. And at the same time, non-disabled people need to be able to identify with a disabled character and say, hey, that's me. I've been in that situation, you know, etc., etc. Now we don't get that. I thought that. Yeah. I thought that the two of the drama excerpts we saw, every time you look at me and cast offs, got beyond the, the gloss to what we call the internalised oppression, how disabled people have internalised how the majority world see us and then start taking it out on each other. And I think that's a part, an important part of our lives, that we have to deal with that and get through that. Uh, and so I think the more that, the, and it's interesting that the producer of that was disabled and the two leading actors were disabled, and I think the more we bring not just actors in, but disabled producers and people, but also people who maybe have isolated themselves from the movement. They need to draw strength from a collective of disabled people. No one person has the answer. We need to set up advisory boards again, like we had on Spectrum back then 20 years ago, to actually say, no, this isn't going to work. You have to do it this way, because, you know, it's an important aspect of life. It isn't just anybody <coughs> dreaming up anything about how disability might be portrayed. It is about being real to our experience. And it seems to me we need to set that up again. Now, we're running out of time. Any last point that somebody wants to make? I'm going to take someone here we saw on, on one of our acts. And up there, those are the last two there. Check shirt at the front uh, and black dress, second row. Richard, if, right if you want to take an extra five minutes. You can. If we can, I will. Yes, yes. Yeah. I'm allowed an extra five minutes, so I can take a couple more. Yes. Hi there, can everyone hear me? Yeah, yes. can you introduce yourself? Okay, my name's Tom Jackson Wood, and I'm an actor, a writer, and I'm just about to produce a couple of short films. Mm. So uh, <coughs> I'm trying to get as much of an experience and more sides of this spectrum as possible. But my main concern has been that with the current situation that the BBC is facing with funding, and with Channel 4 also being a public body, mm -hmm. and with the current climate that is being directed against p disabled people with hate crime on the increase. How do you feel is the best way to respond to that in a way? Because all your ideas have been very good, but you're talk a lot of it, is, to me, has come across as been like you're talking about an ideal world, and quite frankly, what we are in right now is not an ideal world. So I was curious if, by these statements, actually, they would show an alternative to what it's being. A question there to map <coughs> what we're saying to conditions we find ourselves in. Uh, at the back there, yes? Hi, uh, my name's Gillian Dean. I'm a disabled actor, but my disability isn't obvious. It's mm. not a, a, it's an invisible disability, I would say. Um, and I just wanted to ask the panel, really, in terms of exposure and uh, embedding disabled characters, or rather disabled actors, into mainstream programming, and roles being written for the character rather than for the disability, I wonder how important you feel it is that the disability is visible. Uh, because I, I've, I've been for auditions, and I've actually been given parts in which I've been told things very recently by a director, I was asked if I could beef up the blind. Yeah, and it's, yeah. I feel I'm not disabled enough to uh -huh. be uh, eligible for disabled roles, but I'm also not, I'm too disabled for non-disabled roles. And I just wonder what the panel think about disabilities that aren't immediately obvious to the viewer, because obviously in terms of seeing people on TV and in mainstream programming, hopefully society will become more comfortable, but therefore does that, does that conflict? Right, we've got that. And the last person who's got, I've seen, because I've got this extension of time, but I want to give the panel time to come back, so you're going to be the last, sir. Uh, hi, yeah. Uh, my name's Jack Binstead. I'm a disabled actor. Um, and I'm, I'm 19 years old, so I've, I've grown up in an era where disability has become more acceptable, mm -hmm. and we see a lot more about it on TV, and we read more about it, there's a lot more positive comments. And 
I've definitely been, a, I've never been in a position where I've had to struggle to get a date, and that might just be the fact that I'm fortunate in that sense, or I'm outgoing, or confident. I'm quite a confident guy. But shows like Undateables, there's a woman on the Undateables, Penny Cutcott, who has the exact same condition that I do. And I just feel with where we are nowadays with sex and disability, and how much further we've come and it's become more acceptable that it's, it's not a big deal for someone with a disability to be sexually active. Do we need shows like that to flaunt that off? Because it should just be mandatory that someone with a disability is sexually active. And yeah, there might be a different word. Well, I'm not necessarily the word, but I mean, like, it should, it, not that word then, but like, it should be any different. I like it, keep it in. <laughs> I just feel like, yeah, it shouldn't be an add on. You know, it, it's, it's obvious. It, nothing wrong with that. Right, and it's good that there are people who feel that confidence, like yourselves in your generation. So we're going to, if there's nobody else urging to get in, we're really coming to the end of our time. So, three areas there that were brought up. What about people who are invisible, but uh, how do we bring them in? Uh, the invisible impairments, there's a lot of them around. Uh, they do count under the Equalities Act as disabled, but how do you portray them? How, how do they get cast? It's a, 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 just to talk as someone with an invisible disability. That, yeah. um, uh, it's a, a, a thing that I've sort of uh, uh, struggled with as a writer. I think I've written, uh, you know, probably 20 parts for disabled characters on TV on various different shows. I've never written someone with an invisible disability and I recognise that it's an issue and um, uh, I've never worked out how to do it because, um, uh, because it requires so much explanation and one of the problems in TV is uh, you, don't want, you don't want too much explanation because you've got to explain enough of the plot anyway. Um, uh, uh, but I hear you and um, uh, yeah, it will roll around my head. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, right? you know, yeah, yeah. I, think, I think some of the American programs I sort of deal with some of these issues better in a way that uh, the, you know it was not clear that the Which guy one? in CSI had an amp was a double amputee it was only mentioned twice in 15 years so that, yeah. that's pretty invisible yeah 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 and also RJ Mitchie yeah, 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 yeah. 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 I mean there is another example of an actor um, Joseph Moore who's yeah. His, um, he's death. in Last Panthers, is it? My yeah. Uh, he, I mean, he started off, of course, in that big role where he played Death, and he was, uh, you know, really made his name there. But he, he now plays any role, and I think it's about it, there has to be a fluidity for the talent and for the people casting the talent. So you don't have to get too hung up on whether the person's actually whether it was an invisible. You have to just be right for the part. Yeah. My mate says it's a good film as well for another reference. Okay, and uh, any other last points that people want to come back to on what, what we just heard? Yes, Alison. Can I say something about dating? Um, yeah. uh, I'm sure um, Undateables will sort of run its course at some point. But I think you have to see it in the round. It's not the only show about dating. You know, First Dates does include disabled people. In fact, the first series of First Dates didn't include disabled people. And I went and spoke to the, to the net producer and said, Oi, why not? And he said, yeah, but you've got undateables. And I said, no, that doesn't mean you shouldn't yeah. put some disabled people in the first date. Oh, but it all looked like undateables. But then, of course, when they did, it, it didn't, because the show is completely different. And so you just have to, nobody, nobody should look at the screen and say, that's the one depiction of rheumatoid arthritis, or, you know, living your life in a, as a wheelchair user. There's, there should be loads of depictions and we shouldn't sort of kind of load too much expectation onto Absolutely. one show or one... We are, we are as diverse and as ordinary yeah. as everybody else yes. and that's what needs to get across. There is, yeah. you know, unfortunately there's too much stereotyping around, uh, you know, we've got to have a disabled party and we, we need to have more diversity in the range of impairment that's shown and the characterization of those and I think mm -hmm. that, that's where we're moving. Did you want to... I agree with... Sorry, I didn't catch your name. Jack. Jack. I, mean, I agree with what Jack said. It, it, the question is, is it, is it still necessary? But I, I, I think portrayal of disability in mainstream television, you know, very, very prevalent within everything that we watch, that, that is necessary. So whilst it, it, I think the conversation is there, and the, the more we keep having these conversations, the more things will change. Okay. 
I think we've run out of time. I hope you're all sufficiently loved up from this, uh, this discussion. Uh, but we're going to uh, end on a, a, a light-hearted clip, courtesy of Channel 4. Thank you very much.